next to the field workers. Today is my sustainable development. Okay? Today we talk about sustainable development. When we see people like you, and now Abtakhar Shaheen, and Sister Madiha, who are a part of our family, but they're still a part of our family. That where we keep the connection to maintain the sustainable development and the sustainability of the organization. People should not just work for you to make you happy. But if you make them happy when they are working with you, they will always be your ambassadors. And this is what Khar Shaheen is an ambassador of Islam of Leif. Madiha is another ambassador. And Nabil and his wife, when they arrived, would be to see them another ambassador. Madiha was in the UK. Khar Shaheen was here in this very difficult area and he handed over to uh, brother uh, Yusuf. Uh, I was reminded this morning by uh, brother Muhammad Atiq about Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. He kept talking about him many times. And I have to mention the story before get the giant stand up and they sit down. When he died, he was reciting a piece of the Quran because he was poisoned by some of the Umayyad. You know the Umayyad? I don't want to feel about them. Because <laughs> she's from uh, Al Ashraf, uh, the Umayyad. Yes. <laughs> and uh, he was reciting this piece of the Quran. This life to come is made for the people whom they did not want to have a status, higher status in their life, and they do not spread corruption. And al aqiba and their faith, the, the faith of the muttaqeen, the pious people, will be in this Dar al Why I'm talking about muttaqeen today? Because taqwa is not in your hijab. It's not in your beard. It's in your heart. Taqwa is here. Okay? Not in the face, not in the shape, not in the speech. Once upon a time, a woman was a milk woman, Aisha, come next to me here, we'll act together. And Na'ma, come next to Madiha here, we'll act as a mother and a daughter. The, the silly shoes. The milk woman, in the middle of the darkness, was telling her daughter, your other daughter, okay. <laughs> <laughs> daughter, mix the milk with the water. Nobody can see us. Omar cannot see us. Omar in the The daughter, Naama, told her mother, No, mommy, if Omar does not see us, Allah sees us. This is the, this is the seed of taqwa. Who was listening? Because he was passing by the house was Omar himself. And they put a sign on this door, because he was old now, and they brought all his sons. Then I have heard this discussion yesterday. I want one of you to go and marry, not you, but, <laughs> 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 but the, the daughter of, of, uh, of the bad woman. No, not Aisha, I didn't want Aisha. Don't, don't live in the story. <laughs> okay. And one of his sons, his name Asim, married her. And from the daughter of the milk woman, she had married to the ruler of Egypt, Abdul Aziz ibn, 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 ibn Marwa. And she had the baby Omar ibn Abdul Aziz, whom Omar ibn Khattab was talking about him in one of the dreams. So I saw one of my sons in a dream when he rules 
to spread justice. He has a scar on his forehead. And this woman, young girl, her daughter, went to Omar, Abdul Aziz Marwan, and they had Omar ibn Abdul Aziz. Omar Abdul Aziz was poisoned by his cousins because of the ruling. You know, when he was dying, he said, who did this to me? They brought the stave. And they said, how much is it paid for you? He said, 2,000 dinars, not pounds, dinars. To break the money. He took the money and brought them to the treasury. They wanted to kill him. Because the Khalifa is poisoned and dying. You don't touch him. He is safe and he is free. And this is a taqwa of the, the reflection of the ayah that he was reciting when he was dying. Taqwa is not a speech by myself or Ibtikhar or Madiha or any one of you. Taqwa is an action at the right time when you see justice that you can implement no matter what happened to you. And this taqwa. Thank you, the milk woman. Don't mix water with milk anymore. Thank you, the wife of Asim ibn Omar ibn Khattab and the grandmother of Omar ibn Abd Aziz. And now we can start, inshallah, with my sustainable, uh, what? sustainable existence in this movement. Sorry. Just before they start, maybe it's worth everyone introducing himself, inshallah. Ah, it should be really too much. So they know what they're talking about. I mean, uh, the, the speakers. They will introduce themselves, of course, but before they do, if everyone else does. Uh, Aisha, she already. Uh, I'm Aisha, I'm the, the milk woman. woman. The milk woman, and I'm the fundraising coordinator, and I'm from Ireland. Assalamu alaikum, Annette from Italy. I work for the Italy. Italy. Salam, I'm Shahrazad, and I work for Italy in the same department as me. Salam, Umayma, I do admin and join affair in the Irish office. Salam alaikum, my name is Fatima, and I work at the fundraising department in Spain. Salam alaikum, Shaima, Spain, and the fundraising department too. Salam alaikum, my name is Miriam, and I work in the comms and admin department in Spain. Assalamu alaikum, Anna from Spain, from Hans. Assalamu alaikum, Nama from Spain. The daughter of the Mirkoma. <laughs> <laughs> and I work in uh, an office of the Sadanaki and Admin. How's that? It's Mirkoma. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I know Yusuf. Yeah, from Yusuf. I'm the head of the Yusuf. Abdushid Yusuf, program manager for the Mirkoma. Gloria Kalina, from Yusuf. Assalamu so, alaikum, Hamad Ibrahim, uh, from the department, Islamic Republic. Khalifa. 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 Assalamualaikum. Mohammed Adi. I work in partner development at Ireland. Can you, you know who I am? Mohammed Adi, I'm working for Ireland. I am the And uh, I'm Iftikhar. Uh, I used to work for Islamic Relief uh, in Somalia and in Benin. Uh, my name is Madiha. Um, I live here now. I used to work at Islamic Relief. Thank you. You know me. In what department? Uh, in like public relations. I started off at trust and fundraising, then moved to public relations. IRUK. IRUK. Okay, we're going to start. Which one first? Okay, you can take us to your journey while you're here with this time. Very No, 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 no. no, 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 no. <laughs> You've given the milestone of your journey in Somalia and in uh, Kenya, and how did this journey took you to the second level, inshallah? Uh, thank you. Uh, 
Tell me a bit about, bit about your background as well, like where you studied, where you studied. Like, sure. All this, don't you miss? <laughs> no, okay. well, it's possible. <laughs> so, I mean, in this sector, we have, all of us have a story how we ended up here. Uh, but most of us, especially from the Southern Hemisphere, the Global South, most of us didn't choose it by choice. We are the product of some emergency. At least I can speak for myself. I don't know about whether Yusuf or Abdel Rashid, but all of us, more or less, are like this. So I was a student like you guys, doing my bachelor degree in Mansera, Pakistan. Uh, when the 2005 October's earthquake hit our university and our area. So as part of that particular earthquake, the university of course got damaged. It was Ramadan, I can remember it very well. Um, but anyway, as students, as part of different students, whatever activities, uh, I led or I was part of a student uh, relief camp at uh, one of the worst hit area in Balako. So as part of that, I mean, anyway, that was my first exposure to relief work or NGOs. Uh, so while working there for 40 days, one day, a Muzungu lady uh, showed up in our relief camp. And she was asking all the questions about public health and this and that. What does Muzungu mean? Uh, Muzungu means white in Kenya. Uh, that's the uh, for foreigners. So, so it's part of the same thing, sir. No, I'm Muslim. <laughs> uh, but then there is another category where we fall in the Muindis, <laughs> the subcontinent ones. So, so it's part of that exercise. Anyway, that was my first exposure uh, to the NGO world, uh, whereby I started working for someone called Merlin. It was an NGO. We used to have our office in Old Street, London. Uh, which now got marked with some of the children. Uh, so anyway, and I came with them to the region. Uh, in 2008, uh, just after two and a half years, uh, to Somalia, mainly Kunsan, whereby I was the health cluster coordinator because my background, initial one was microbiology. Uh, microbiology. And then one day, where we are sitting like this, uh, there used to be a huge debate about uh, remote management humanitarian access because 2008-9 was the year when uh, probably it was the year of the most piracy attacks of the Gulf of Aden in the history. I think around 44 ships were hijacked or something. So all the experts were in the town. So one thing that I've learned in my career uh, beware, no one else came. Uh, so, I mean, for me, I was lucky because I was probably the only expert living in Galway when every single expert was outside of that because of the fear of kidnapping. And anyway, who would kidnap a Pakistani for money? <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and also, my risk tolerance was pretty high. Personally, coming from the shower and having worked in Quata and ceasefire line areas of Kashmir, Neelam Valley. So my risk tolerance was also a lot. So anyway, the NGO community, we used to have a forum called NGO Consortium. So there was a huge debate about we need something to do with uh, uh, humanitarian access and how to manage remote programs. Things that my brother Rashid and Yusuf, they were talking about. So anyway, as part of that group, there was a subcommittee myself working for Maryland and uh, Oxfam country director, who is now with UNICEF, uh, Abdullah Yusuf. We were working on that committee. And as part of that, we were presenting the remote management programming to all the donors and the NGOs, communities. I was representing Maryland. Abdullah Yusuf was representing Oxfam. Uh, so as part of that, normally my program was a little, I was programmed to start with Bismillah Rahman Rahim and this and uh, the, the Islamic things. So anyway, at the end of the presentation, as we were coming down in a elevator, one guy comes to me and asks me, saying, uh, my brother, where are you from? And I'm like, I'm from Peshawar in Pakistan. And he's 
Oh, I'm listening to Shao. Did you ever hear about Islamic relief? And I'm like, of course, I know it very well, pretty much, uh, from Pakistan. And he said, uh, did you ever think working for Islamic relief? They have a position. By then, my car was ready anyway. I came back to Maryland office. Uh, but I couldn't, because he did not introduce himself to me. Uh, that was a two minutes discussion. It wasn't me. No, it wasn't you. It was Maki. Oh, Miko. Maki, uh, Maki Abdul Nabi. I didn't know him. So anyway, and then a friend of mine who was interviewed, Ibrahim Hassan, who is now the country representative of PSI, we were sitting next to each other and he said, he told me, Tahar, there's a position in Islamic Relief. Uh, they are looking for a country director of Somalia. Uh, and I should apply. And I said, well, by the way, right now I met a Somali brother who told me because I was misinterpreting him. Anyway, when I applied, the following day, I got an email from the same Maki saying, by the way, I'm Maki Abdul Nabi Hamid. I'm in the region. I'm head of region. Let's have a coffee at Jai. <laughs> and that's how that was my initial introduction to Islamic relief. So it was probably uh, that presentation or whatever. Anyway, uh, the, I got the opportunity. Then I worked for one year uh, with Islamic relief, 13 months, until I came to know about Dr. Hani and we worked on some very important tasks. Uh, we could not complete the task, but anyway, I left Islamic relief. Uh, then I was working for NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council, again in Bosaso, uh, Somalia. That I got a call from Dr. Hani, my brother Shabil, and Dr. Hassan. Uh, and then, because they were thinking to start a regional setup, and they were scoping. And that was the time when uh, we had the East of Africa famine. Uh, so, as part of that famine response, uh, I was brought back, uh, and, and I had very many personal agendas as well, because Bosafo was a very boring place. Uh, Nairobi was, uh, of course, I mean, hmm? so, so it was like a music to my ear. So I, come, I came back to uh, the region, I worked for uh, a year and a half again um, in, in the region, whereby we tried our level best uh, to hand over some remains of what remains of some ideas about regionalization uh, and then handed it over back to my brother Yusuf who I had dearly known uh, from his time in Ethiopia uh, and from his time with Islamic Relief Sudan. Uh, so that was my history with Islamic Relief. Uh, after that, after leaving Islamic Relief, uh, I somehow got into what is called the development consultancy. Uh, the for-profit sector. Uh, and as part of that, uh, I got into the bids, and the first bid was with Plan International, which is a new model, because now sometimes these NGOs, the big NGOs, uh, they are also pretending to be contractors. So it was payment by result, uh, a for-profit project for SCDO uh, in Pakistan and Bangladesh. I was leading the Pakistan part. Uh, South Asia WASH results program, uh, whereby I was the chief of party. Uh, I completed that project and I ended up in South Sudan uh, to lead a $104 million education uh, program for USAID. Uh, but then in July, uh, the guys started fighting, Sir Wakir and Machar. And USAID, US government decided to stop all the projects which were aimed at supporting the ministries. Uh, so, that was the time I had to leave prematurely Juba. Uh, to be honest, I wasn't very happy, very unhappy when I was leaving. But anyway, uh, so that is how I got into uh, USAID uh, projects and ecosystem in Somalia, whereby I've just completed uh, uh, their flagship governance program, uh, Transition Initiative for Stabilization, a $67 million. Uh, and now I'm waiting for uh, a decision on the follow-on, but in the meanwhile, assisting my company with some business development and supporting programs and, uh, and capture works in Mozambique, South Sudan, uh, Somalia. So that's a bit about my uh, journey. Uh, there are a few things. 
not a few, quite a few, uh, which I learned from Islamic relief, and I think Islamic relief, I can, I'm indebted to it deep inside me, uh, and myself and my brother Abdurrahman Sharif, some of you uh, might have known him. So myself and Abdurrahman used to talk a lot about it. First thing is this, uh, there are quite a few things, and I didn't know about attacks on Islamic relief in 2016 or 15. But Islamic relief, this logo, is considered to be a bulletproof jacket. And we are thrown often by... Can you explain what, what bulletproof jacket means? Yes. Uh, what I mean by it is, I mean, whenever no one can operate in areas which are extremely dangerous, that is when donors come to you and say, by the way, why don't you go to that area? That's how we ended in Dada, because when there were attacks on care, when there were attacks on uh, others, we were told, okay, let's go. Uh, so, I mean, we become the choice of delivery in times when those areas are extremely dangerous. And I remember using this word to Mark Bowden in Kiki once they were talking about certain things. She is back in Somalia, by the way. Uh, when they were talking about certain tasks, and we said, guys, we are not... Uh, we are not bulletproof. We are also human beings. Uh, so that is one thing. Second thing, this, uh, I didn't know the world right holder, but I have many stories to talk about how Dr. Hani was always allergic about the word beneficiary. Um, and I mean, we can talk more, but this new understanding that who is our employer, uh, I learned it. Uh, the emphasis on it and the concept of it from my time uh, in Islamic relief. Third thing, to be honest, life is very good when we move on. But one thing which I miss with Islamic relief, the mission-oriented approach, which is uh, the conviction that everything is possible and we can do everything and anything, taking any kind of risk. So that mission-oriented devotion and dedication, Wallahi Lazim, I couldn't find it anywhere else. Uh, and to some extent, it became some part of uh, the subconscious and, and the thinking around it. Uh, so I'll stop here, uh, otherwise I can take uh, eat on the time. So I just want to do that. No, and, and then there are... Yeah, we'll, we'll open the discussion. <laughs> Um, so my journey is not quite as interesting, <laughs> I think, anyway. Um, and just, first of all, thank you, Dr. Hani, for inviting me to this, and, and you sit as well, it's a real honor. Um, so I have, had not grown up with lived experience um, of like a disaster, you know, like what Dr. Tafar had. I was brought up in the UK, um, but I, my journey was quite direct into the, into the development and humanitarian sector in the way that I knew that this is what I wanted to do from when I was studying. Um, that, that might be because, you know, growing up, my mom would always tell me stories about when she grew up in Bangladesh and how she would um, always be looking to try and help and, and, and serve. Um, you know, with the, when there were homeless people, she would tell them, my mom, I've invited 10 homeless people to come and have dinner with us tonight for you to cook something. Um, so it was always very inspiring from my mother. Um, so I studied international politics as my, as my uh, BSc, and then I did a master's in development studies. Um, and then I found, and I graduated, and this is gonna show my age, but I graduated in 2009, which is around the crisis time when there were no jobs available and you know, no one really, there was nothing available. And especially in the humanitarian development sector, as you know, there's, there's not much funding available, so it's very competitive to even find a role. One person's doing, as you was it you, is doing four people's jobs. Everyone's doing four people's jobs. Yeah. Um, and without experience, you know, it's almost impossible to find something. So at that stage, I was just like, okay, I just need to get my foot in the door, do something to, to just get in there. So I uh, interned for a year at two different NGOs. One was Action for Southern Africa, another one was United Nations Association, and they were both advocacy NGOs, um, just to get some experience. And, and it's one of those things where I had the privilege and, and I was able to do an internship. They didn't pay me you know, because I had the support of my family and I was able to do that. But not everyone had that privilege, and I, I really understand and see that. Um, and then I was still finding it difficult to find a job because 
intern experience is not always paid experience and people don't take that seriously. So I was really struggling. Um, and at that stage, I thought, you know what, I'm just going to find something in the charity sector that's paid, anything I can find. So I, even though my, my goal was the humanitarian sector, um, I applied for literally any job I could find and I found a job at the Muscular Dystrophy Campaign, which is a health charity that looks at, um, you know, supporting people that have a disease called muscular dystrophy. Um, and I was doing uh, trust and foundations fundraising in that. Uh, I had no experience in that, but you know, it was a very entry level position. And I thought, you know what, if I've got some paid experience, it'll help in, in, in getting the next role. So I did that for about a year. And then um, I met a friend that I was doing some Arabic classes and I made a friend there that worked for Urbana for Lisa, do you remember Lisa? Yes. Um, and she told me that there were some positions available at Islamic Relief. Um, so why not go ahead and apply? So I did apply and then I got the job. It was at Trust, it was Trust and Foundations fundraising again uh, with Islamic Relief UK. Um, very quickly, I think we all realized in the UK uh, office that that function for, should probably sit with IRW just because of the nature of how things were structured and, and the jurisdictions between IR UK and IR, IRW. And then because of that, then I moved to public relations and comms. Though I really wanted my, my, in my mind, and Dr. Hani fixed this, and I'll tell you how, in my mind, real humanitarian work was if you work in programs and nothing else. Um, and so my focus was always programs, programs, programs. But very quickly I realized, and you'll I mean, see this in my journey, that actually, you know, um, number one, sometimes you have to do what you don't want to do to get to where you want to be. And I don't mean give up your principles or anything, but I mean the journey you have to take sometimes to get to where you want to be might be or of course as long as you've got your goal in mind and you make sure that you're keeping uh, going towards that goal so as i said i went into comms um still in mind wanting to go into programs um and i wasn't there wasn't really anything available for me at islamic relief at that time but at the, the year that i was there i had a really great time it was like a family which i'm sure you will see um and the experience at islamic relief you know, then helped to get my next role at an organization called Malaria Consortium. Again, I was working in business development and bid writing and this kind of thing. Um, and then I moved to Sweden for two years for personal reasons. Uh, and then I came back to London. And when I came back to London, I was going through a very difficult time in my life. And I started working at Muslim Aid. And honestly, you know, my work at Muslim Aid or my work in this sector is really what helped me through that difficult time in my life. And I think. That's one of the things we're all very privileged in this room because we work in this sector and no matter what's happening in our life, you know, this work is healing. It's, it serves us before it serves those that we, that we serve. Um, and at, at uh, International Rescue Committee, by the way, we call them clients. We don't call them beneficiaries. Clients. Clients. Business. Yeah. Well, not business, but, you know, it's meant to be like a mutual it's because it's not something that we're, we're, we're yeah. serving them with. <clears throat> so then I worked at Muslim Aid, and I, I would say that, um, you know, it was one of the times which helped launch where I am now. Um, Muslim Aid was going through a tough time at the time as well. It was a very blank slate. I got a lot of opportunities to do a lot of different things. And, you know, and this is the thing. Ironically, and I, I speak to the, to the sisters here mostly, I think, sometimes, you know, we are timid. We're shy about what, what we want to do and what we want to achieve. And, and, and grasping for those things that we think is out of our reach. Uh, and because I was going through that difficult time in my life, I, I, my tolerance was zero. And I was very sort of um, assertive. I was very driven just because I wanted to focus on work. I didn't want to focus on what, what was going on in my personal life. And so I, I grasped for the opportunities and I realized that in a world where, you know, no offense to the brothers, in a world where, you know, that, that you know, women are left behind, unless you grasp those opportunities yourself, no one's gonna give them to you. And then you will realize that you will shine. And so I worked at Muslim Aid for two, two and a half years. Um, and then I uh, moved to a smaller charity for about nine months. Um, I didn't really enjoy that. And then I saw this opportunity here at the, <coughs> at the International Rescue Committee um, for a global communications role. And this is the thing, I told you at the beginning that I wanted to keep going into programs. But I realized that actually, um, I realized that I'm actually good at communications. And so sometimes you have to embrace that what you want to do 
is not um, what you want to do is not always um, how uh, how what is best for you. So um, I applied for this role. Um, <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to hear anything. I'm, I'm okay. enjoying it. You're enjoying it. I'm making him sick. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, I, I saw this global communications role, and I realized it's a really good um, balance between programs as well as communications. Um, and I applied for it. The, the role was originally meant to be based in London, but then um, you know the, the portfolio was Africa and Yemen. And they had an office here as well. They wanted this role to be based here in Kenya because it would be looking after 23 countries in Africa as well as Yemen. So I applied for the role, I got the job, um, still thinking that I'm gonna take it from London. And then like during the interview process, which took like a month and a half, I very much realized that really you can't be taken seriously as a humanitarian if you haven't lived in the field, in the field, you know, I don't like to call it that, or get the experience, the, the lived experience, the context working with people. So I decided to, whilst I'm able to move out here, so I live here now since May last year, um, and it allows me to, given my portfolio is all of Africa and Yemen, it allows me to travel to the region where I need to um, see for myself, um, be immersed in the context. Um, and yeah, here I am, I'm, I'm loving it so far. Um, it's a great experience, I've been able to travel to many of the countries that we work in. Um, and yeah, so I, I, what I would say in terms of my journey is the, the two main things I've learned is that, um, some, as I said, you, sometimes you have to do things or go, go off course sometimes to get to your goal. Um, other things is that, you know, sometimes you have an idea of where you want to be or where your life is gonna take you. Um, and life experience and the course of your life is not dictated necessarily by you completely, but you have to just embrace it and then realize that it will work out in the end. Um, also, that's it. she is mentoring me mm -hmm. as a board member of Muslim Choice Forum. I'm not mentor. Dr. Hani is the mentor. So I remember when I first... Tell them what's Muslim Choice Forum. Muslim, okay, the Muslim Charities Forum is a UK-based, um, I guess, umbrella body. It's a, almost like a governance body. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a membership body of Muslim charities based in the UK. Um, the idea is that this forum is meant to serve and better and improve and help Muslim charities in the UK, whether that's their governance or their um, anything that they might want to help with or, or want, need help with. Muslim Charities Forum is meant to be there as, a, as like an umbrella body to serve them and help them. And Dr. Hani is the, the, the chair of of that um, organization. Well, not, not yet. Inshallah. <laughs> um, and, and yeah, you know, it's always been an honor to work with Dr. Hani. I call him our guru. He's the humanitarian sector guru. Uh, we always look up to him. And yeah, we're all blessed to have him um, speak to us. And, and uh, it make, means a lot to me that he was asked me to come and share my journey. Thank you. Thank you. You can blend your chair. And I just have one more thing to say. Um, in relation to the, the bit I, uh, I heard when I first came in about uh, the crisis response, yes. um, one of the things we do at International Rescue Security, for example, is uh, with the funding partners that we have, you've got Spain and Italy, et cetera, or you know, the likes of FCBO and the bigger institutional USA, we have a crisis modifier payment. I don't know whether you use that. Um, it, it basically means that if you've got funding for a specific, for example, three-year project, there's a contingency that if a crisis hits in that region, if, it, if, it, if the crisis uh, ticks certain criteria, you can use some of that funding as a crisis modifier to divert it to your, to your crisis so that you don't have to wait 22 hours or however long it takes to go through this process by the time to release that. So um, it's just a suggestion. Thank you. Now the floor is open and you can start asking our chief guests Sister Madiha, Brother Khar, about anything you would like to mention, to learn from their experience, between them, between both of them, that at least 35 to 40 years of experience in humanitarian and social work. And, uh, but they have managed to 
go through the journeys to different organization and they're still being elevated inshallah and elevating somebody like myself okay first sister fatima so um because you sister um, madiha worked at islamic relief worldwide and worked here on the field uh, yeah actually both uh, i would like to know what's the main difference what in the in the terms of in terms of the um, um, work dynamics what the, what's the difference that you can feel is biggest and what's the change so um <clears throat> I think when we sit behind our desks in the West or in the UK, we don't quite understand the, the volatility of the situation on the ground. Um, it's, you know, we're expecting reports immediately, we're expecting great photos, we're expecting all of these things to be able to get back to these donors. And we don't understand that as it is, the, the staff on the ground, I'm sure Brother Yusuf can attest to this, are already so stretched, they have already so much to do, and there is as it is so difficult to even deliver the programs on its own, that the expectations, to manage the expectations of those back, back home or back in the West or the donor's expectations is very, very difficult. So one thing I would take away from your trip here is to, to manage your expectations and your donor's expectations of what is possible in the, fi in the, in the field, I don't like that word, but in the, in the country <coughs> programs. Um, you know, you, you have to have a level of patience not because people are not doing their jobs out here, it's because they're already so stretched and they have very limited capacity. And the way to fix that, I guess, is to do capacity building, not because they don't have the, they don't have the know-how, but maybe there's sometimes a disconnect between what is expected on, at a donor level uh, and what, is it, what, is, what can be delivered here. So one of my roles, for example, I'm a Vizimia Global Comms Officer for all of Africa and Yemen, and one of the things that I struggle with is to get you know, good quality content, photos, videos, etc. So one of the things I do is go and train local staff on how to do storytelling and story spotting, um, and how to take good photos, how to take good videos. Um, you know, and, and, and one thing I would encourage if you work with donors is that you um, put in a line for capacity building where you can. That just means that the money that they're, they're going to be giving will be more effective if you're able to build the capacity or the people working on the ground. Uh, I, I mean, the bulk of the answer was already given by Sister Madiha, uh, but to tell you the truth, like where I am right now, uh, probably I have seven, eight people. So there is a uh, security director, there is this director, that director. Uh, so I often tell them, guys, I'm now the chief of prayer, uh, chief of party, because basically I just pray for them. But at Islamic Relief, as a country director, a regional director, you write proposals yourself. You have five meetings a day with uh, 29 donors. You manage the security. You manage. Uh, you are the principal in uh, So, I mean, there's a lot of burden in a way. Uh, I don't know, probably things have changed in the last eight years, God knows. Uh, but from when I was, and it has helped me a lot, because now, when I'm interviewing the security guys, they think that probably I, I am the security professional. It's just because I can pretend it, because at Islamic Relief we did almost everything, uh, which helps a lot. Uh, but that also brings a lot of uh, burden uh, on, on the team in terms of the work-life balance. Uh, I mean, it's really, really, it can be hard. And that is why trips like this are very important to have that interface uh, and, and more importantly uh, to have this understanding between Islamic Relief partners and Islamic Relief worldwide to start with because I would find usually back in the day uh, Islamic Relief worldwide guys better understanding than the fundraising offices uh, in terms of the day-to-day -day workload and things. So it's really good that now there is this outreach from uh, the fundraising offices like Italy and Spain, now at least they will understand uh, what the day looks like for uh, the guys in Mandera, Wajir, and uh, those areas. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes, Sister Ashema. Yes, I have two questions. One of them is 
first one and it's okay if you don't answer <laughs> but I cannot um, I'm wondering why you left this on the clip um, and the yes, second that's one yeah that's the personal one and it's okay because I push them out <laughs> <laughs> it's okay if you don't answer and the second one is um, you talk about um, how many steps you take uh, to be where you are so now that you have the knowledge, is there is some is there is something that you will do different or uh, no problem. Uh, two things. I would like to reword that question a bit. We haven't left this planet. Yet. <laughs> <laughs> we we have left the payroll, uh, and even this time around, I'm not trying to be political, but I'm. Uh, Yesterday, or day before yesterday, when I woke up, I was thinking I should check on Dr. Hani. Wallahi lazim, without knowing anything that Dr. Hani was in Nairobi. Hmm? And it happened second, third time. Once, in fact, it's an early in the morning after Fajr, I texted on Facebook, where are you Dr. Hani these days? And he's like, I'm in Islamabad, <laughs> five kilometers away. So, I mean, we haven't left. Uh, we just left the payroll. Uh, and that is why when we see Islamic relief, uh, we own it. Uh, that is one thing. And this owning also explains the second part of the question. Uh, that at times, like when I'm working now for uh, other projects and offices, and I'm sure it's with all of us, uh, not with some of us, almost with all of us. Uh, when we are working for other organizations, we are, gu we are guided by uh, the professional code of conduct and the professional expectations in terms of work, work life balance. With Islamic relief, there is a, there is kind of this volunteerism, and there is kind of this ownership. If we forget about the contract itself, uh, so I mean, thinking back, uh, ten years or seven years, whenever it was, uh, yes, there are a lot of things I could have done differently. Uh, there are a lot of things. Uh, that I would approach differently. Uh, however, I mean, uh, probably things happen for a reason, and uh, Steve Jobs, uh, in one of his last uh, speech at graduation, I'm sure most of you would have seen it, uh, he says that you cannot only connect the dots when you look backward uh, to establish the cause and effect and the hikmah uh, of a decision. Uh, we cannot really mark our way ahead, uh, that is not possible because uh, as human beings we have certain limitations. I think that's right. Um, the reason I left to some relief is because my contract ran out and there was nothing available, nothing else available at the time. Um, and I, you know, wanted to, as I said, in my, in my mind I wanted to get into programs, but it's funny because I never ended up getting into programs because I realized that comms is actually my, my area. And, um, Similar to, to what Dr. Tahar said, actually, exactly that. You know, in my mind, you know, I, I had my, my my life planned out a certain way, and even my career. And looking back, I wouldn't have changed anything because if all of those things had not happened, I wouldn't be where I am now, and I'm very happy where I am now. Um, and it's one of those things where, you know, it's it's you have to embrace sometimes the journey that your life is going to take you. Um, you know, do what you can and you know, have your drive and you know, do what you can to get to where you want to be. But if it doesn't work out, then know that it's better for you because you know, that's God's plan for you. Um, you know, as it says in the Quran, we plan and he plans and he's the best of plan. And, I, and truly, I believe that every time something not worked out the way I want it to be, I see in hindsight that actually this is best for me. So um, I wouldn't say I'd change anything. Um, no, I wouldn't say I'd change anything. Thank you. Thank you. Sisters, brothers, Gloria, I see, I can see you are ready <laughs> to shoot. Um, shoot the film, but don't shoot anything else. Yes, I have many questions. I'll huh? probably pick up real later. But, okay. um, well, one, uh, just what you've mentioned from the Quran that you know, everything happens for a reason. So I suppose even for me being a non Muslim, you know, I can, sometimes you, you can think of it as a how did I get here and uh, how is it working and is it working for everyone and yeah, five years later, 
it must have happened for a reason, God knew why. Um, but more than that, because you are in the global role and you have you said you have challenges facing some of these contents from the field offices. Um, in terms of capacity building, are you building the capacity of the uh, comms focal point or is it the like you said you don't use the field offices but is it like you know we're here in Nairobi mm -hmm. but we have our projects happening in the very interior areas. Yeah, yeah. So are we building the capacity of the province people to support us? Yes. Are we building the uh, and the challenge there again is sometimes we have short term projects and long term projects. Mm -hmm. So the turnover of yes, staff, yeah. I'll tell you I think in the last five years we've done two trainings and all those staff have left except JAMA, JAMA the regional desk coordinator, who will not really support us uh, directly <coughs> in communications. But all the program staff have left. So is it, do you have to do it continuously and afresh mm -hmm. every single time we have a new, um, new staff coming in? Mm -hmm. um, and then also in terms of fundraising, those are two questions in one. In terms of fundraising, how are you strategizing, uh, strategizing the production of content? Is it requirements from specific donors what they want, or is it random? Because sometimes they have an SLA, it doesn't really specify exactly what the the donors would require from the field offices. And if it's a fundraising office, do they? give um, the requirements, like maybe at the beginning of the year so that it can be planned, you can plan from the different field offices. Mm -hmm. So in the first, que in the first question, um, so one of the things I was really surprised about when I got to International Rescue Committee, given how massive it is, it's like 30, 30 35,000 staff around the world, you know, even South, South, South Sudan alone, there's like a thousand staff, <clears throat> was that, Every country program doesn't actually have a communications officer, and I was so surprised by this. Because, you know, Islamic League is obviously massive, but comparatively to International Rescue Committee, it's very small. Even the likes of Muslim Aid had a comms officer in every country program. So I was like, okay, this is very strange. Um, so what I'm having to do is uh, training program staff, um, and that is why, each, and, and the program staff that are not contract based because then the turnover is less. But you know, in a nutshell, yes, you have to constantly do that, uh, constantly train. But it's better to sort of train someone at a regional or country level that can then train other program staff if, if, if they need to. So for example, whoever that your Kenya office uh, in the main HQ in Kenya, they can then, if they need to, have regular sessions, quarterly sessions with the program or field staff in the different remote lo localities um, and we can we can touch base about that later on as well with regards to visibility requirements so we have likes of like government of Canada and the USA and FTBO but also obviously smaller smaller funding uh, funders as well um, and normally the, the budget comes from visibility lines in the in the budget that they require or they have but we submit visibility plans as well. So sometimes they'll tell you, no, we want 10 social media posts and we want a web article and we want you to pitch to media. Um, other times, you know, they're very flexible and we then submit it. We say that we're going to go with this $20,000 you've given us for visibility, we're going to collect, uh, you know, video and interviews and photos. And then from that, we're going to create a video for social media. We're going to do web article. So then we submit it. So then we manage that expectation. I don't know if that answers your question. Yes. So are you using the program staff for video or consultancy? No, so, that no, we, we, so I go out and I, I will hire a photographer and videographer from the country that I'm going to. And unless there's no one available, or I'm not seeing the quality I want, and then I'll fly someone in. But normally, like for example, um, next month I have to go to Uganda. We've, we've sourced local um, photographers and videographers there. We've seen their portfolio. I'll start the trip. Um, and we'll work with program staff to, to collect that content. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
to say you want to speak? Am I allowed to ask a question? Yeah, allowed. It's okay, yeah. yeah because you are Guru, Guru or Bora? Definitely not Bora. Who's Bora? What's Bora? Bora is Muslim. Oh, Bora is like a parent. Yeah, I see, I see. He's very friendly. Bora is white. White. Yeah, white. Yeah, okay, fair. She says fair, yeah. My friend Daisy. Um, Stand up because we can't see you. Um, most of the, the people in the room are very early in their careers, yeah. uh, including myself, as long as I look, I'm quite early in my career. Um, what, what one piece of advice would you give everyone? Um, early in their careers, starting the journey in Islamic the Islamic is probably the only organization most of us have been exposed to. Um, what would be one piece of advice? I know it's quite a broad um, question. Quite a, a direct question. You're going to take a couple of minutes to think about what. what no, no, you don't worry about that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I would say take every opportunity you can to do different things so that you're able to um, understand the different sectors within the sector. You know, when I first started out, I was very. I was very, it was a very niche role, you know, trust the foundation, stuff raising or funds or whatever. But I think the likes of the Islamic Relief Movement Aid, some, you know, these other, the, the smaller the, not that it's small, but the smaller the NGO, the more opportunity you have to do different things. So if you see an opportunity where you want to try something, like if you want to work in the advocacy department or if you want to work in HR or whatever else, ask, just say, look, I'd love some experience in this. Can I get some experience one day a week or even out of hours? And, you know, Take the opportunity, just grab the opportunity that you see, and don't be shy about it. Uh, I'll say uh, more or less the same things, but a few things. Uh, I mean, three things which I see are very important in our sector. But before I come to those three, uh, in our sector you will find four categories of people. Uh, and, uh, and I'm really afraid with this thing, so I can't talk about no, no, it. Okay. Four things. So the, ones, so, the ones, so the ones who genuinely work, the ones who pretend to work, the ones who sometimes work, sometimes pretend to work, and the ones who do not even pretend to work. So, so the first and the four are easier to spot. The ones who work and the ones who do not even pretend to work. Those ones are easy to spot. The problem is between the two middle ones. <laughs> I wonder. No, the ones who sometimes pretend to work and sometimes work, and the one who pretends to work, uh, who pretends to work. So I mean, these two. Uh, but for the first category, I'm sorry if I'm using it, but it's a bit like Nafsi Mutmaina and Nafsi Ammara are easily to spot. Out. The problem is with the Lawamas <laughs> who are on a pendulum, <laughs> who are on a pendulum. So considering that scenario, uh, I mean generally for the people who genuinely wants to make a difference and do something, three things. One is the conviction. Uh, yes, it can be done, we can do it. It does no matter how hard it is. Uh, situations will throw you into scenarios whereby you have to make a decision in a fraction of a second. Hmm? And one time, I'm not encouraging all of you to be impulsive, but I'm saying one time, uh, I mean, many times throughout my career, I was hit with a child and I had to make impulsive decisions, uh, but I moved on uh, because I saw that that conviction is more important than getting stuck with that. So the conviction is one thing. Second thing is the knowledge, uh, the knowledge. And I don't know if conviction is somehow like tawakkal, I don't know. Uh, but second thing is the knowledge. Because conviction without knowledge is also a problem. And the third one is initiative. Hmm? To mobilize these two inputs, you need an initiative. These are the three important things. When we, as we grow into decision-making roles, uh, does no matter in program, communication, or anything, you, you need two more. 
One is the wisdom, the basira. Because knowledge is basara, it's, it can tell you where to go. But when you have 39 balls in the air, which ball to catch first is the prioritization, that one comes with the basira. And fifth one is, I don't know, the, I don't know how to name it, but it's about the authentic leadership. And what I mean by the authentic leadership is uh, being open to criticism, uh, being open to step back and allow others to give you a strategy because a leader shall not be the one dictating or giving you the strategy. A leader is to create a forum and environment for people to develop a strategy. So, so the enabler, I mean, enabling is probably the, a better word. Uh, so these are uh, the important things. But now, there's another thing for Islamic relief to consider, or any employer in the sector. I joined in this sector as a daily wages translator, $6 a day, working almost 24 hours. From Maryland in, on 1st December 2005. And I left that organization as a country director. And the funniest part, the one who hired me and who for whom I used to be translating, I then managed her as my country health director when I was her country director. And probably some of you may know her, Paula Sansom, a great human being I have huge respect for. How did it happen? It happened because my organization took chances on me. As a young guy with someone who didn't know anything. So they, and that's why I always call Merlin as my mother organization. So when I see someone, and it's a bit of a biased as well, but when I'm shortlisting and I see Merlin on some CV, I feel like it's one of me. That is because I can associate how many chances Merlin gave me. But then coming to Islamic relief, I'll tell you, no one in my age would have given the regional director role. So Islamic relief also took chance on me probably in five things it worked, in nine things it might not have worked, but it's fine. So, I mean, you need, and, and, and as Islamic relief, probably we need to take chances on all of the global talent that we have, uh, because there is another problem which my sister Gloria said, and I don't know the recent story because I'm a bit out of the NGO uh, world, I'm a bit remote, uh, but, I mean, probably our salaries used to be in the lower bracket. So one of the reasons could be probably uh, the packages in the spectrum outside. Uh, so probably when you take chances and you, on your own people and you grow them, uh, they carry your kind of DNA who stays. Like now, my brother Yusuf has been staying for 12 years. It's not that he couldn't go for bigger salary. Uh, and there are a lot of users around the globe. Uh, so, but also on um, those positions, at uh, the beginner uh, level, we need to take chances on people. Uh, and then another thing is, I mean, again, uh, I can't tell you how happy I am to be here with you guys, because this is something I personally advocated a lot for uh, when I was there, that we needed to bring this uh, gap together uh, between the fundraising office and the delivery. Uh, and probably, I mean, uh, we need to find a mechanism within the organization to uh, extend those opportunities across and see how we can proceed and go. Just, sorry, so the one thing I, I definitely wanted to say in terms of uh, a few advices, especially working in comms, and I, I'm sure I mean, I know, Com I know uh, Salah and uh, Dr. Hani don't work in comms, but I think one of the things that they probably would agree with me on is intention. And one of the things that's so difficult in this sector, if you work in the sector in any capacity, but especially if you are um, public facing, which in my role I have been a lot of the time, you know, interviews or whatever, when you're public facing, to keep your intention pure is so difficult, so difficult because you will get praised. People will say, oh, you've done such a great job. And it's so difficult to not do more of that to get that praise, if I'm very honest with myself. 
It's so difficult because people are always going to say, look at you and see you doing this great work. But if you don't keep your intention pure, then your intention will be that I want to do this to get that place. And that will just ruin your your whole line of thinking of why, you do, why you're doing this work in the first place. So find ways to humble yourself. You know, find ways to make you re yourself realize that you were chosen for this, God has put you in this position, and that's no less than someone that actually, because I work in comms, yes, but actually the real work is carried out by those that are in the country, you know, out in the field, 10, 12 hours a day in refugee camps, giving the actual aid and doing the actual work. Um, and I think, I think that's, that's one of the things that I've struggled with most and will, will continue to struggle with. And at the beginning of your career, I think it's something to keep in mind. Let me ask you a question. I may have, I may have the right to ask questions, Sister Aisha, after disqualifying you. Yeah. <laughs> so what is the difference between boss and leader? Explain to me, please, because I could be very bossy. A leader brings you up and a boss keeps you down. Yes, boss. It's about the task at hand. Leader is about the opportunities out there and how to help you realize those. Uh, boss is all about take this input, put it here. Uh, a boss can be a fixer, but a leader is, I mean, I don't need to be as a leader, and I'm not saying I'm there, may God help us, take us there. Uh, but it's a different thinking, it's influencing. Like now I gave you the example of Paula Senso. Paula is not here. She's no more in the NGO circle, but I still look at her. Uh, there are many people uh, who shaped us, influenced us. My mentor, Dr. Hani, being here, for us to look for him on the day of Eid or just to talk to him. I mean, those are the people. So leadership, the next level of leadership is influencing. So there is boss, manager, leader, and influencer. So in my brain, at least I look at it. The four categories of the pathway. Thank you. Uh, I see boys or brothers are not as asking any questions. And uh, yes, hold that. Is it? Yes, and the Arab. I translate into English. Stand up, please. I can see you. He's from Spain, is it? From Barcelona. And uh, did you want the trophy this year? Maybe <laughs> you know? Okay, not yet. Second question. Okay. أو لم يتم تجديد له العقد يعني أول فرصة يلقى يعني يجد عمل آخر أحسن في ما الإغاثة أو ما تعطيه له الإغاثة يعني يطلق المؤسسة والمؤسسة تكون قدمت له يعني خدمات كثيرة فما هي Okay, and brother Khar and sister Madiha, he said divorce the Islamic leave, but they didn't divorce Islamic leave. They only divorced the payroll because they have got some other job to do and they're still connected to the organization. Sah? Okay. <laughs> العاملين في الإغاثة يعني على الأقل رد الخير للمؤسسة هذه التي قدمت لك قبل أن لا تكون شيء. Yeah, he's saying that I need an advice for the people not like you because they are still connected with this Islamic belief. And uh, what your advice to the other people for just when you see you mentioned the four categories, the middle two, 
actually who once they find an, another job opportunity they jump out and ignore without actually paying any uh, uh, any credit or tribute to the organization. Anyone of you? Well, it's a difficult question. Uh, because, thank you. Uh, because uh, thanks for it. Uh, but I think uh, there are pros and cons of both. Uh, one thing is, I mean, because Islamic Relief is not like any other organization. It's a mission-driven uh, uh, organization. Uh, so for it to be a mission-driven, uh, probably at some point, uh, because I mean, organization is only uh, how many years old? Uh, 35, uh, 38 years old. Uh, so probably it's not enough time uh, when you compare it with organizations like Caritas, which is another mission driven organization, uh, which was established in 900 something, uh, more than 1000 years. Uh, because Islamic relief is different than other NGOs, because you have mission, uh, you have uh, faith inspired action in, you still have the conventional NGO stuff. Uh, so it's four in one, and then you have your own seasonal program, uh, which is kind of a realization of this faith in action. So you have these four things. Uh, but I think you are right. This is a question for Islamic Relief at some point. Uh, I wish the organization could establish uh, what we used to call Ahbab in some other forums. Uh, to, I mean, there are a number of people globally uh, with United Nations, with different NGOs, with different donors, uh, who are still uh, in those positions because Islamic Relief took chances on them and contributed to their professional growth, their personal growth. Uh, so probably uh, this is something, and I mean, one of the suggestions could be uh, probably three ways we could organize it. One is the sectoral ones, uh, but again, it will go to the organization strategic discussion. Uh, like now, uh, and I'm sorry, I don't want to go there, uh, that what is the strategy of the organization in this uh, world whereby professional niche is needed. There, is an, there, there are health organizations, there are education, uh, there are relief, there are governance, there are development, where do we belong as Islamic relief? Uh, so, but once that question is sorted out, and probably it is sorted out, then you could make uh, health professionals for Islamic relief uh, forum, uh, which would mean that all the doctors who work with Islamic relief in Sudan, Dr. Walid al Bashar, uh, and the guys who worked in Pakistan, Sekandar, everywhere, the health, the sectoral organization of forums. Another way could be the geographic ones. Uh, people who have worked in certain region, like now my brother Abdullah Yusuf, who used to be country director of Kenya, uh, is on a very senior role with FAO, FAO. Uh, so probably if there is a li uh, livelihood, so I mean there, there can be sectoral, there can be geographic, and there can be thematic forum. What I mean by the thematic ones, uh, bring the Imini guys, bring the um, uh, logs and operations guys, uh, they, because they have a lot of uh, new knowledge about what is happening in the industry. Like now, uh, Sister Majiha is giving us uh, what is happening with IRC in terms of comms. So rather than getting a consultant from outside uh, who will give you control C, control V product uh, once in a while uh, with 150 pages and sometimes even the name of the country is there because they did not use the control R <laughs> to replace <laughs> rather than them. Have your own uh, brain trust. Uh, but again, this is something for the leadership to take. No, brain trust. You and the quote of the book, brain trust. Uh, and the difference between boss and leader. Okay? Because I'm just no, that's true. So, I mean, it's about, uh, it's good to establish some of these things and uh, have once in a while consultations. Uh, like in USA, it was what we call community of practice. Uh, so there is a mini community of practice. There is uh, 
uh, comms community of practice, access community of practice. So establish those communities of practice. Uh, that way, uh, those guys can be at least your better advocates. Uh, they can feel more connected uh, to, to a bigger cause uh, and can be part of the family, our extended family, it's not the family. Thank you. Uh, I think the question is. Okay, any other questions, brothers and sisters? And what's the time available for us? We have time. Yeah. Who's have time? Yeah, right? okay. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay, but any other questions? Muhammad's quiet, I don't know why. He can speak in Italiano, spaghetti, macarona, <laughs> and uh, what do you call it? Uh, pasta, pasta osta. <laughs> واحد لازم يسمع وخلاص يا سلام انتو ابسور يا ابني انت ابوك لا ابوك مصري ولا امك مصريه اشوف اجيب الكلام ده منين؟ لكن جيرانكم طيب اوكي بكل فاهم فول اوف ويزدم سيتنج اون ذا تيبل هير سو وي كان نوت سبيك كان بيضحك علينا الاخ يس كمون Uh, can I be positively discriminating against both of you till I find somebody else? Yeah, that's fine. Could be on Fatma spoke to answer those questions. Ha, ala dona, ala ona, ala trena, ala ala, ala ala, ala ala, ala Fatma. Then ala Muhammad. Okay, Fatma go first, then Muhammad go after you. Okay, um, so my question, another question that I, um, I think would be very eye-opening is you describe one major um one major sorry uh, test or um big challenge you came to face while you were working the islamic relief you want them to describe yeah a major challenge and how they faced it the most difficult challenge that you faced in islamic relief or after they left no no in in islamic relief yeah Oh, I, see. I, okay. have a, I have a good one. Okay. <laughs> so one of the things I really was, my family are all from like investment bankers and bankers. And one of the things in that sector is that you have to, if you want to advance, you have to give up Islamic principles, like, you know, go to parties where there's alcohol or shake hands with men or whatever else. And one of the things I really wanted to do when I started in the sector and I always prayed to it, you know, prayed for it, is that I don't want to give up my principles to, to advance in my career. And so one time we were at the, we have in, in London, we have these, in England, we have these uh, um, party conferences. So like the Conservative Party, the UK Labour Party, these are political parties. They have conferences in different locations around the UK. And so I was um, helping to organize Islamic Relief stall at the Conservative Party conference in Manchester. And um, I don't shake hands with men. And William Hague, who is this massive politician, I think he was, what was he, Foreign Secretary? I don't know what he was. He was Foreign, Foreign Secretary at the time of the United Kingdom. And uh, he came to our, he go, they go to all the stalls. He came to Islamic Relief stall. And um, he put out his hand and I said, I said I'm sorry, I don't, I don't shake hands. And then I continued talking about Islamic Relief or whatever else. And I mean, I don't know whether I should say this on the, on the live camera, but I, someone in the in Islamic Relief had a, had a problem with the fact that I didn't shake hands. Even though, obviously, and that for me was a challenge because I had come to Islamic Relief um, with the idea that, you know, I would be able to operate within the principles of faith, um, but I was penalized for it almost. And that was for me for a, cha a challenge because I was not happy that, you know, I'm working for a Muslim organization yeah. and they're asking me to do something that is not Islamic. But then that discussion happened and we moved forward from it. And actually, you know, and I, and, I, and this is one of the things I'll say, never have I ever had to um, stick with my principles and, and Allah has not opened doors for me. There's never been a time where I've, you know, for example, the International Rescue Committee is one of the biggest NGOs in the world, not Muslim. But when you establish your principles from the beginning that, you know, I need a place for prayer, I won't shake hands with men, I won't, I won't go to places where there's alcohol, and you know, whatever else your principles are, you know? You'll find nowadays, especially especially after the George Floyd movement, you can really be your authentic self and people will, will respect you for it. So don't be shy about that. 
you know, that's one thing I think that we in the business sector, we have like some kind of inferiority complex. And I think one of the unique things, and I'm going off a tangent, but one of the unique things, and I was telling a friend about this, is I'm a relief for the likes of Muslim Aid, have a unique position, especially for access. I remember when I went to Iraq straight after uh, ISIS left, with Muslim Aid it was at that point, but we were the only NGO there at that time because of the access and the acceptance that we had because of our Islamic identity. And this is the thing, and this is why Islamic Relief, being as big as you are, is so well respected in the wider sector because of the reach that you have because of your Islamic identity, because it happens to be that in the likes of Somalia, or Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, that your Islamic identity is what gives you the acceptance and the reach in some of these areas which are controlled by opposition groups or whatever, there's a trust that Islamic Relief brings with it, which gives it a really great um, access. And I've gone off tangent to your question, but I didn't Thank you. answer it. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm just picking, uh, trying to pick your side. Uh, I mean, one thing was, and probably that was the reality of the region and the place that I worked in as well. Uh, the one phrase that I could describe uh, was predictably unpredictable. Uh, so uh, you plan something Predictive. predictably unpredictable. Yeah. Uh, so, so there was so there was a lot of uh, so there was a lot of uh, unpredictability in the air, uh, and part of it was because every day uh, the Somalia famine. So at first the case load was only Beba coal, then we found out no. It was all the way to Dadaab, then we found out Jajiga was in it. So, I mean, the goalpost kept changing. Then the funding, we used to be around in the region 10 to 12 million, and all of a sudden we found ourselves 33 or 35 million. Uh, so, growth, because with my little microbiology remaining, uh, I mean, <laughs> cancer is also a growth, but when it becomes uncontrollable, uh, and you, Dr. Hani's philosophy of uh, horizontal versus vertical growth. So, I mean, there were so many unpredictabilities. Uh, and then on top of those, we were establishing a region. Uh, and by then, uh, at the same time, there was uh, a serious discussion going on in the entity about governance and the role of the regional trustees and global trustees and how the global Islamic relief. So when you have 33 layers shaking and you are trying to introduce a 34th one, uh, that, that was probably the timing, uh, the context, uh, the beginning of uh, the region because there was no uh, kind of established norm or something before us. So probably all of it. Thank you. Muhammad, is Muhammad the last one, brother? Uh, okay. I had one question and I have two, <clears throat> if that's okay. It's tough, please. Go ahead, go ahead. Um, what keeps you inspired? Um, Both of you. And the winners are so. Yeah. I think the people that we serve, they, they teach you such resilience. And they just keep your perspective and everything. Like literally, if you, you know, I was in South Sudan just two months ago, and it's probably the worst, it's right, right, not worst experience, but the most difficult living conditions I've ever come across. And I've traveled the whole world with this work, this sort of work. Um, in South Sudan. In South Sudan, it, 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 it was really, really tough and really rough. But, and then it makes you think, well, what am I complaining about? Like such silly, silly problems. And I think the inspiration is that regardless of difficulties, and yeah, they might not know better, they might not have seen what we, the sort of lives we live in, but regard, but they still go through difficulties. Some people, for example, in South Sudan at that time had lost entire lives, livelihoods, crops, everything they depend on floods. And regardless of that, there's still such a resilience. You know, well, for example, the tsunami in Indonesia in 2018, they have faith, you know, they, you know, they lost everything, lost their families, their livelihoods, their homes, but they still have faith. And I think that's very inspiring. Well, for me, almost <coughs> not the same. Uh, it's the people, it's the institutions we built, we leave behind. Uh, like in my current job for the last five years, 
we have been constructing air strips and roads, uh, basically uh, in the district commissioner offices and the democratic processes of 4.5, probably whatever. Uh, so with its own limitations. Uh, so I mean, uh, when you see that those things are still standing, uh, that is where you take uh, the pride back home. Uh, that is one. And second thing for me, there is an additional indicator which I always believe, uh, which I always believed in from, from my own personal experience. Uh, but Dr. Hani told us, uh, I remember that boardroom in this DOD office, uh, that we needed to take the, to transfer the leadership, the global leadership from global north to the global south. I remember that sentence very well. Uh, and I always kind of believed it, but I didn't have this refined thought. So when I see, uh, so the colleagues who join me, uh, I'm always very happy to be replaced by them. Uh, so, and not just one or two people, but I do have uh, this belief that we need to grow people, take chances on them, give them opportunities. So who started like in as a PDO, FDR director programs, uh, and then there are a number of guys. Uh, so that is something which personally satisfies me. I feel like I've done my part of giving something back. Because we don't have a lot of opportunities in Somalia, Kenya, Ethiopia, South Sudan. Uh, things are really bad. Second question. Second question is, um, with all your experience, if, you, if there was a, a single, or not even a single, what would be a message that you would, would want to share with the communities from where we come from? No, so, I, let's carry on. Yeah. So a big part of our role is we work with, on, on a grassroots level, with communities within Ireland, for example, or the UK, or Spain, or Italy, or wherever it might be in the Western world. Uh, what would be a message if you want to share a message with the donors? Uh, what, I mean, is there a particular message? I mean, can you mention, mention capacity early? Obviously, people, there's an expectation, but it's, it's always a limitation. Um, I mean, that doesn't have to necessarily be the message, but, but can, if, if there is one. Can I add to your question yeah. another message? The message to the community, okay? The message to the donor, okay? The message to the young people. The three message, three message huh? Three messages, huh? Message to the community, donor, and young people. Because the wealth of knowledge in this room is unbelievable. Because you are living here in this area, your conviction is more than, than what we have in the UK or in America or in France or any part of the world. Three messages, please. Who goes first? Adi, Badi, Sanna. I do it in Arabic way, sure. funny way, and you have to listen to me. Adi, Badi, Sidi, Muhammad, Adi, Shadu, Hattu, Kullu, Aladi. So one of the things I'd say, and I know this might be a little bit against Islam, Islamic relief principles in the way that volu volunteering, don't, don't, don't yeah, volunteering is uh, it's fantastic, and, and and of course we should we should do it a lot. And one of the things I would say, you know, in my in my thinking, I've moved towards is that. Yes, you might be in the UK, you might be in Italy, in Spain, or you know wherever else. Um, and yes, there is value in coming to see what's happening here on the ground. Um, but really, when you come here and try and volunteer here for two weeks, three weeks, and try and give back, the impact that you're going to have in those three weeks is 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 not relevant. The only person that's going to serve is yourself if you're here for three weeks. You're going to make yourself feel better. You're not really going to add any value to the people on the ground. With Can the I money. Them to, because we had this discussion before you. Yeah, I call it volunteerism. Our one was more like for, for staff, for staff to come to the field. Staff is different. Experience. Yes. Yeah, that's different. Staff is different to volunteering because you're here for the long term. Yeah. Yeah. And you're here to understand that your role in the in Italy or Ireland Island can, can be enhanced by the experience you've had here. It's different if you're just coming for three weeks. Because the money you spend, the time you spend, could basically fund the teacher here for a year, for example. And they, then people won't have that sense of abandonment. You know, for example, people come here and 
we teach orphans for three weeks and then that orphan who's already been abandoned will form a bond with you and then you abandon them again, you know, after three weeks. It's a, it's just not adding value to anyone except those people that are coming to volunteer. As it's much an egoistic as that, way, no? Sorry? It's, it's like to be Absolutely, egoist. absolutely. You as much, to think about yourself. Yeah, yeah, you feel good that you've come for three weeks, oh, I've done such a good thing, but really, have what have you done? You know what I mean? Um, and I, I know it's a very difficult pill to swallow in our sector, and that people do, and I know that people want to come because they, they've got good intentions, they want to see, but you know, the, the clients or the beneficiaries, they're not, I hate to say it, they're not zoo animals that you come and see their poverty. And you know, that's not what they're here, that's not what they're doing. So it's, it's, that's one difficult thing to sort of communicate. Leave it to the experts. All of you here are working for IR, for IR. you know, you actually you live here, Tell the volunteers and the donors and whoever else to leave the expertise to, the, to you as experts to deliver. They don't need to come out here, that's number one. Number two, for the donors, um, I think yeah, it's about managing expectations. And I think actually everything in life is about managing people's expectations. I was saying this to a friend yesterday, you know, uh, what? just because you want the funding, don't over promise on what you can deliver. Because you can tell them obviously that you know, the, the situation on the ground is volatile, this is what we can do, this is what we can't do, um, and you know, manage their expectations of, of what's possible and what's not. That means you're having to lose funding as a result. I think that's worth it, because the worst thing you'd want to do is under-deliver, fail, and then you've lost a donor forever, and then lost your reputation as well. Um, and then what was it, youth? <sighs> youth, I think. Yeah, I think the one about intention, what I said earlier about intention is for people involved in these sectors is, is probably my key one. Thank you. Uh, when you say donor, do you mean individual givers or do you mean institutional yeah. donors? In most of our work is an individual. Institutional, yes, yes, that's what I have. Most of, yeah, yeah, because yes. there's very few of us that work with institutions okay. in the room now. So, so I'll start with the uh, community. No, I'll start with. The change agents here, uh, and it doesn't mean that I'm uh, any better than one or other. So number one is uh, believe in yourself, which is what I already said. Uh, but there are some practical things. You know, I personally started three, four times a master, Coventry University, Liverpool, and I never completed it. Huh? Then this time around, I told myself I have to do it, uh, and Alhamdulillah, I'm done with it. So, so even if it is continue to grow in our learning, it's important uh, because no one is going to leave the stage to us. We have to claim it and reclaim it, and that claiming will come uh, with how we can prove ourselves. Uh, so, and you guys are people who are associated with Islamic Fiji, are probably 1% of our even Muslim youth in the West. So you guys can be the top bearers. Uh, the problems with people like myself, Yusuf, and the ones who come from this side of the equation, we don't have those degrees, for example. Now when the UN, World Bank, IMF, the policy forums hire you, the first thing they start is with the, uh, which school you bring which kind of degree with. You guys don't have those problems. Hmm? We have those problems. And again, one plus one can make two or even 1.5. And I'll tell you why 1.5 as well, and sometimes even zero. Huh? We have a saying in Pashto, two kids went late to school. So the teacher left one saying, where were you? And he said, sorry, he had lost his coin on the way. Then he slept the other one, where were you? He was, I was sitting on his coin. So that is what I call one plus one zero. So both of them were busy. Uh, uh, both of them were busy. So going in our own uh, templates and formats and add one more column and delete one more row. Uh, so I mean, we need to <coughs> believe in ourselves. We need to continue to grow. Uh, be it academically, be it intellectually, be it in our faith, be it in our opportunities. And with every single apply, we create a, an opportunity. 
So, I mean, that is for us uh, in the room, for donors. Why Melden could not survive and Alhamdulillah Islamic belief is still there? It's because of the donors which are there. What differentiates Islamic relief from others in the sector are those people, and it doesn't matter how much they give, but it's their ownership, it's their belief. And I remember back in the day, Islamic relief used to, there used to be this, uh, especially with FCDO, when you were with I have you, uh, that if you bring one pound, they will bring uh, the, the match fund opportunities. But then I've seen now something else as well in the sector whereby these big companies, market donors and those guys, they put money from their pocket, spend it on research for beating the drum. So they spend probably 50,000 uh, to get a project from a CDO for 50 million. Mm -hmm. so, so, so there is some role for Islamic relief globally to play as well, how to use the money of the fundraising, our own fundraising as well. Uh, the unrestricted into some um, advocacy, into some uh, uh, growth at scale, into bringing some specialism and, and those things. Uh, apart from, of course, if there is no other donor that we can find for Mandela, then we need to put that 100,000. But if we can spend some money for a workshop to bring FCDO by creating that one report for Mandela, uh, probably that is something which we shall be uh, doing at a global level. Uh, so our donors are the ones who cover us. Uh, it doesn't matter how much they bring, uh, but this is the main reason why, th those are the roots which gives us legitimacy to start with, uh, which gives, so I mean, uh, they need to keep doing it. Uh, third one was, what was the third one? Uh, the community. Uh, you, you said, said it is, uh, the community. And that is somehow probably for Dr. Hani, my sister here, uh, from MCA. We are 500 Muslim charities in UK alone. Uh, Al Khair, this, this one small big, everybody wants to do Ramadan distribution. Let's talk about some specialism, even among ourselves as a Muslim community. Uh, that why are we spending all of the money for the sake, the sake of dates in Ramadan? Can we divide the burden either geographically, uh, uh, geographically or thematically that, okay, I work on the health, uh, probably reproductive health in today's Afghanistan. Uh, Islamic relief can do education. Uh, so, I mean, we divide and conquer. And that way we can position the Muslim charity sector uh, in, in a very good way. Because back in the day in 2008, there was this whole discussion with Atta al -Mannan, Alhamdulillah, I also got a free Umrah as part of the discussion. <laughs> what we used to call I oh, I see. Oh, I see. Uh, uh, oh, I see. But it became, it didn't go anywhere. So probably we need uh, to think of those discussions again. Uh, and divide and conquer. Uh, uh, let's have a shadow cabinet. Uh, okay, Islamic relief, you are protection cluster focal point. Muslim aid, you are shelter cluster focal point. You hire engineer, you hire protection experts. So when our guys compete in those clusters at a global level, at interagency standing committee, at Geneva level, at New York level, we can have some say, some contribution uh, of people of 1.5 billion, uh, because right now you will not see any of Muslim charity uh, on those tables even. So you are missing that entire perspective. So you end up uh, people who are Aligarok specialists, huh? There is this term in Somalia. Uh, somebody said, I know, uh, I'm expert of Somalia. Okay, so you are expert in what? I know how to cut a rope. A rope is an invasive uh, uh, shirt. Uh, so, I mean, people who have just been there once or twice, then they keep talking mm, on those policy tables because we are nowhere. So probably as a community, we need to start thinking uh, about it. I'm sure they are already probably doing it, but it just came to my mind. Just to conclude, before the brother uh, uh, Yusuf and brother Salah, uh, on these three points, I'll start with community, 
then we we'll use general donor. If we don't respect the community, how do I mean? What do I mean by respect? To, to go to them. In the good old days, in the good old days, we used to spend Ramadan on the road, not with our families. 27, 28 days leaving our family alone. Never had any break in the fasting with our family. Not only myself, the people were there at the 80s. Okay? Driving. Every day we were in a different community. Going door to door, street to street, shop to shop, we distribute leaflets. Okay? The community felt it. We used to sleep in mosques and in houses of people and eat whatever is there on the table. No hotel, no rooms, nothing. No expenses, nothing. That's why some of the community is still remembering your good old days. And that's why this is still coming back to you because we have planted the seeds which make the roots to be very strong and nobody can uproot it. Despite the fact some governments, global governments, trying to uproot the organization, but they are failing. You know, 2017, 2018, and others have big shake-up against Islamic Relief, but still there because of what? Because of this community support and the grassroots. If we have no grassroots, we become like anybody else, like clowns. <coughs> this is community. <coughs> Second one is young people. As he, uh, brother Iftikhar uh, and sister Malih Mishan, believe in it and be confident. That you do it. And one day, you will do it. What this discussion, I don't know how many years ago, I think, I think maybe 30 years ago, with some of the Muslims in the UK. And we were working together. Yeah, we used to work together, meet together. Uh, because volunteerism at that time was not like volunteerism nowadays. There were not many cameras, there was no Facebook, there was no Twitter. Real volunteerism. Stay in the office till midnight, just putting the leaflets inside the envelope, sticking the envelopes with sponge, going the, taking the envelopes to the post office, and going out to the door to door and distribute. This was volunteerism. There was no show off. As Sister Malih was talking about it nowadays. <laughs> Have you seen me? Okay. At that time, the discussion happened. Now we are behind others. We need to become shoulder to shoulder. And you have to be ahead of others. And this is a challenge. We cannot be ahead of others unless we do more than the others are doing. Coming back to the PhD and uh, these things, I did also my doctor of medicine. But to do it, I have to do the extra work, which to make it very distinctive. Not, I'm not praising the work. At that time, everything was done manually. And here you can get the lesson for you young people. On one side, the work was subhanallah, tawfiq from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Okay? And I mentioned this to you before. But the message on my thesis was in the gratitude. To whom? To Allah. Three pages. Scientific knowledge was no blank. I failed. You know what I failed? But when submitted my thesis, I did not review it, I did not read it, I did not even check the references. Of course, they failed me, and some of the examiners said that he is Omar. That's why I love the Omar very much, and I behave sometimes like Omar. Okay, I'm just going to do this. But you know, when the, 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 the other examiners looked at, at, the, at the quality of the work that they are talking about, they found it has never been done before. So they ignored the Quran. They ignored changing the name of Abu Qasas to Abu Qasim al Zahrawi, which is the first one to, spy, to uh, uh, describe Spina Bifida and Encephaly. And, and when they sat down with me, they appointed somebody 
to correct my English because the, the, the chief of the department and the head of the college of pathologists said, I want your thesis to be in our library because of the because of the quality of your work. When the professor talked about Quran, I had a longer beard. And I was very, in, in my youth, and younger anyway, 30 years younger or more. And when he talks about this ayah, you know what I told them? In confidence, belief and confidence. Is it scientific knowledge or not? You know, I'm a miserable look. I'm miserable now. You say yes. Yes. Thank you. He <laughs> <laughs> said, yes, scientific knowledge. So, because I cornered him to the knowledge of science. So, do you want me to remove it or keep it? He said, no, 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 keep it. So, it became scientific knowledge, not uh, missionary or not theological knowledge. I kept it. I ate. I got the degree. He said, both of them said, believe, confidence, as well as to make this intention. For the donor will never come to you unless the community talks about you. Whether the donor is an individual or is a government. 2002, no, 2001. Claire Short, who was the minister, did not cancel her meeting with us on 13th of September. Because once she said to us, we want to work with you. The same year, she gave us one million pound for Afghanistan, for Kandahar and uh, the area for the camps there. Because of the community support, which were built, over the last 15 years. So the government and the big institution will never give you money unless the community supports you. And by the way, your registration with ECHO was approved at the end of September 2001. Before September the 11th, I was agitated because we sent the application a year beforehand and they just took the telephone and called the people in Brussels, told them, hey guys, I've submitted our in confidence. Why are you delaying our application? Said we are bureaucratic. Said we need an answer, yes or no. And by the end of the month, after September the 11th, 20 something, in the same month, we got our registration and we signed the agreement in April 2002. Echo, British government and the other giving you the funding because of the community support. You got the connection? Thank you. Salah will close the meeting and then open it again. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you too.